Lord, thank you so much for your word and what you have to show us in the, in the riches, the depths of your word. And then as we looked at in the last couple sessions, um, your word is so rich. It, it is a lot like stepping outside of it to gaze at the stars and the, and the beauty of the heavens. But then, uh, you know, we send the Hubble telescope up there into space and what we once thought were individual twinkly little stars are uh, whole galaxies. And that beyond those galaxies are more galaxies and uh, made up of many stars. And Lord, your word is, is so full and so rich that we need to take more than just a superficial read of your word and to dig in. And, and thank you for the Holy Spirit um, giving us insight into your word and helping us to understand it as we pray and we seek wisdom. And Lord, we just pray that you help us to each and every one be Bereans and and uh, not take my word for anything or some other teacher's word for anything, Lord, but uh, just pray and, and seek the scriptures and uh, use good discernment, God. And that's what we pray for is good discernment in your word. Uh, and we pray the same for tonight in Christ's name. Amen. What I've been trying to show, and, and the, the, the question comes up, and it is a good question. This is different from the way I've done the book of Revelation in the past where you just start with chapter 1 and you go through and, you, and uh, sometimes... Some of these verses might intersect and you might draw them into Revelation. But the reason why I'm doing it this way is because, um, I don't know about you, but online and with, in certain groups, you get a lot of pushback in, to whether the book of Revelation is even about um, the tribulation period or not. What is the tribulation? Is there even a rapture? So you get a lot of pushback, and so that's why I'm um, using this illustration this timeline here to not just have a construct on the wall and say well this is what we're doing right here this is what we believe so everything we're going to read is going to fit into this timeline that we constructed first you got to demonstrate the timeline first you got to prove out the timeline and see if it's really viable if it's really um if it's really as you're presenting it so looking at, at that day those days this generation doesn't really fit in with what Jesus was des describing in Matthew 24. On the surface, you'd say no. And uh, many people do say no. Many good sound Bible teachers who I love and respect say no, there's no, there's no rapture at all in Matthew 24. Well, I hope up to this point I've demonstrated that there's two different events, three different events really going on. There is a little bit of some A.D. 70 going on in the Olivet Discourse, especially when you get into Luke, but when you get into Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, um, you have a lot of second coming in there. So it'd be when you think about it, it'd be kind of strange for Jesus, Jesus to skip over um, what the beginning of the tribulation looks like. And it would be weird for for him to jump right over that period of time and go right into the second coming and mention it, or just to talk about the troubles in the tribulation, but not really describe what happens to the church. We know elsewhere he does. So he hadn't really described it before. Um, people would, will rightly argue, for instance, about the trumpet and what is the last trump and, all, and these different arguments. Revelation 4, 1, uh, what does that mean? Um, come up here. What, what is 1 Corinthians 15? When you get into about the 50s, there will be changed in the moment and twinkling of an eye. And why wouldn't that be mentioned by Jesus? But again, uh, as we prayed, we've been talking about, and I uh, hope you understand and, and um, hopefully maybe even agree with with. My point, and that is that uh, when you look closely, there is in subtext in the all of that discourse. There's got to be some rapture in there, and and uh, tonight's going to be one of those nights. We're really kind of wrapping up. We're going to close out Matthew 24. And everybody's going to say, "Yay, Amen!" And, but I wanted to prove this and demonstrate this this perspective in this timeline before we go into the rest of Revelation, because theoretically, if this is correct. The rest of Revelation 
all the way up through chapter 19 is about this stuff that Jesus was talking about. And it is the tribulation period, and it absolutely did not happen in 70 AD. So, um, again, in this slide here, showing um, the church age, and you see the happy little tree there. That's a, that's a fig tree, believe it or not. It's a little tiny, and it's hard to tell. Maybe from that far away, it might look more like a weed, or, um, you know, it might look like... Broccoli. broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about the broccoli prophecy tonight. Uh, and so then um, Revelation 4. So that's what we're doing is we're trying to close all that out and demonstrate that this is what's going on. And, and usually, you know, I, I, it was an info download the last two weeks, dumping a lot of information about the fig tree generation the fig tree parable, or the, that generation, or this generation, as Jesus referred to it, and demonstrating um, what all it includes and why. And so um, I'm happy for your patience with that. We could have gone slower, but I, I thought it'd be interesting to go in and demonstrate that with just about all Old Testament verses, because there's a lot in the Old Testament about coming back into the land. And so we're gonna we're gonna move forward. So we've so far we've covered all of these this three point threefold line of questioning in the scriptures, Matthew twenty four. And so we're at the very tail end now of this line of questioning right here that um, Jesus again answering the questioning of the disciples in order, in the order that they were asked. Regathering of Israel into the land as um, a last generation event is, is key. Again, it's not the complete fulfillment of those things. Um, and uh, the way I've tried to describe it before is it's like a, a stage play where the curtain's not parted yet to show us the play, how the, the very end time events are going to play out. What it is is it's the setting of the stage. In other words... For instance, the Abrahamic covenant, they were promised certain borders. The Jews were promised certain borders. They've been in that land in the past, and they're in there now, but they've never enjoyed all their borders. There's a time in the future when they're going to get all their borders. This is behind the corners, or behind the corners, behind the curtain. This is Jesus setting the stage for all these end-time events right now. And then when all these things get fulfilled and we see the book of Revelation play out and so forth, that's curtain time. That's um, part of paradise found. We've had paradise lost in the garden. What happens when we get into the book of Revelation is the seal judgments. This is Jesus pouring out his judgment, his wrath upon an unbelieving world. And it's him beginning to take back the title deed to the heavens and the earth and to establish himself and take his throne. Let's just start with verse 33 here. So also when you see all these things, again, all the things that he's been talking about up to this point, you know that he is near at the very gates. Now, I want to pause real briefly there, and we, we are going to get into this, but this terminology is wedding tradition terminology. Um, he is the bridegroom, and we are the bride of Christ. And part of that, again, is, is a rapture kind of a deal where there is a part of the marriage ceremony that is called the taking. So what's happened is, in brief, a Reader's Digest condensed version is, is that um, the bride and the bridegroom are betrothed. Um, there's been the promise to return and he's gone away to his father's house. Um, this is what happens in the betrothal. What happens when they are betrothed is, you know, what we're familiar with is we leave a ring. There's an engagement ring. Um, the, the gift in this case, and, and we will get into it at length at another time, like I said, we'll show a video, but um, he's left us the Holy Spirit and the promise of his return. Um, he says, in my father's mansion are many rooms. There's a better translation in the Greek. 
So what happens is, is uh, the bridegroom now has made this commitment. They are betrothed. They are, in essence, married in, in every way but the physical. He's going to the father's house. He's going to do a room addition. And the tradition is a lot of times they'd be gone for roughly a year. It'd take that much time to do this add-on to the family home. And at the end of what, about a year, when the bridegroom has the, the room addition completed, he, he, according to the tradition, has to go ask the father to check it out. The father's an experienced one. He's the one who knows. He's got a lot of years experience. He knows what the woman wants, right? Now, at the end of this, when he's finished, and the father agrees that he's finished, the father says, go take your bride. So for us, when we're praying and we're saying, Lord, come quickly, maybe what we should be saying is we, maybe we should be praying to the Father and saying, Father, send your son. That might be the, a better way to pray because the, the son doesn't come until the Father says to. So the Father says to the bridegroom, go take your bride. What happens then is a lot of excitement. His, he gets his wedding party together, his best man, who will be John, get the wedding party together, and they grab pots, pans, lids, whatever, things to beat on tambourines, things to bang and make noise. They grab some trumpets, you know, shofar, that kind of stuff. And they start a processional. A lot of times, just for extra fun, is they'll wait till midnight. And that terminology comes up about the end times, too, when Christ comes for his bride, midnight. So it's a bit of fun. It's wait till midnight when everybody's asleep. So you wake the whole town up. You're going down, and they're going, oh, a wedding. This is exciting. Everybody comes out front, and they're watching, and then they're clapping, and they're excited. They're watching this processional go by. Ooh, I wonder who it is. Oh, I think it's, a, you know, little, you know, Joseph and Mary, that type of a deal. I think it's, it's, it's them. Oh, yeah, that's right. So the procession goes, and there's a lot of shouting. The best man will be shouting things like, you know, Behold the bridegroom, that kind of stuff. So they'll be yelling, they'll be shouting, blowing the trumpet. What happens with the um, bridesmaids or the virgins is they're supposed to be paying attention. They know about a year's, they don't know the day or the hour, okay, but they know the season, they know it's been about a year. They're waiting, they're kind of watching. They've got their lanterns outside, and they hear them coming and they see them. They go in and they tell the bride and her family, hey, they're, they're here, they're coming. So they, she gets up, she get, grabs her trousseau, she gets her things, she grabs her gown, she's ready to go. Interesting thing that happens is, is that the bridegroom does not come all the way to the house, does not come in and knock on the door. He makes it to the gate down by the street. So it's not a complete return. She meets him at the gate, they meet just like we meet the Lord in the air. So they meet part way. And then the two parties merge at that point, and they all go the rest of the way. They go into the Father's house. The gates are shut, just like the parable of the ten virgins. Okay, the gates are shut. Nobody's in or out. And this is a week long, seven days, a grouping of seven. It's a week long celebration. The whole celebration goes on for that week. And then official ceremony goes on inside more details that we, we can get into later or watch the video. So, so this is wedding terminology is my point. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, in verse 34, this generation that we've just talked about the last couple of weeks will not pass away until all these things take place. He's talking about all the trouble in the world. He's been talking about the regathering. Um, and he also talks about the coming of the Son of Man in the previous verses, right? That, so he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words won't pass away. So in other words, this is a, I mean, this is a promise. This is the way it is. This, this isn't going to, I'm not going to renege on this, okay? Verse 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Now let's pause and, and take a look at this. And I have this nice and big and bolded on, on this slide because there's something to, a couple things to point out. That has a double meaning. Concerning that day or hour, no one knows. That is, again, is like the wedding ceremony. That's 
that's part of that because uh, the son doesn't know he's got to wait for the father okay and that's the way the tradition is as we just explained now Jesus at the time that he's preaching this did he know when he said the son doesn't know well we know from Philippians 2 and other passages, Jesus left all his wealth behind. He left everything um, behind but his nature concerning being God. But uh, all the things that he had before with the Father, uh, he'd given up. In John, one of the things you read very often is that all the things he knows, all the things he has is because the Father gives it to him, the Father reveals it to him. So everything is handed down by the Father. And this is part of his first incarnation because he identifies with man, right? He came here to be born... Uh, as a, as a human being, so he's 100% man and 100% God. How that works, please don't ask me. I don't know. I just take it on faith. The Bible describes both. So he came, comes down as a man to be troubled and suffer through trials and tribulations just as we are. And he goes through all the same types of things we are. So there, he was limited on his knowledge depending on time. And his knowledge was progressive as the Father revealed it to him. So at this time, it's very possible, I would even say probable, that Jesus did not know exactly what the Father's plan was as far as his return. But one thing we do know is that by the time he resurrected and he had his glorified body, he knew. And he sits down on the right hand of the Father when he ascends in heaven. He knows. He knows everything now. Jesus now knows exactly when he's going to return. He knows all the same stuff his Father does. He's restored to his former glory in every respect right now. But... Um, a second meaning of this, um, concerning that day and hour no one knows, is also terminology that we've seen before, and we've seen it in John. That's also a phrase that's used concerning one of the feast days of the Lord. Which one is that? Class? New moon. Rosh Hashanah. Right, yeah, new moon is exactly Rosh Hashanah. Um, Rosh Hashanah is kind of more of a secular, secularized term, and it's the one we're really familiar with. Um, it's Yom Teruah. In Leviticus 23, it's the Feast of Trumpets. And uh, we can get more into the, the feasts and show how the feasts show how the end is going to be, too. The long and short of it is, is that in the Lord's Feast days, and um, the Reader's Digest kind of condensed version that ex expanded on elsewhere in the Pentateuch, uh, is revealed in Leviticus 23. The Lord says, these are my feast days. He tells the Jews, you'll keep them forever and ever. Uh, Jesus said that he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. Well, interestingly enough, like, for instance, when you go into 1 Corinthians 15, it describes how Jesus is the fulfillment of the feast days. And it, it starts with some of these feast days and reveals what are... What are um, the seven feast days. You can give them out of order if you want, but what are the feast days? Passover, Passover first fruits, first fruits and unleavened bread, Pentecost, rather. Pentecost. What one of those pentas? <laughs> um, the Pentecost and Pentecost, which is the Feast of Weeks. So, uh, Passover, how was Passover? How did Jesus fulfill Passover? And, and he fulfilled these on the day on the celebration day. Easter week is what we call it incorrectly, right? But it was that week, Passover week. Now, how did Jesus fulfill the Passover? Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. He's the Passover lamb, exactly. And then um, what else do we have here? We, we have the whole week is like a week, a celebration week of unleavened bread. And there's an extra Sabbath on that week. It's a high holy week. But what else was there that week? Someone said it here and someone said it over here. First fruits. First fruits? How is how is he how is he unleavened bread first? How is he unleavened bread? What does that mean? What's leaven in the Bible? Sin. Sin. So he's without sin, right? So he's without sin. He bore our sins on the cross and so forth. Yet he himself is, is without sin. Okay, first fruits. We've told in the scripture what about first fruits? He's first fruits from among the, the dead, right? First resurrected. Yeah. First one resurrected, or the preeminent resurrection. He's not even not, not even the first one, because he, he resurrected several himself. Okay, so he's the first fruits though, and that's a positional thing. 
more than anything. It's in the, it's the preeminent or the most important, most important resurrection. So he's the first fruits of the resurrection. Okay, now Feast of Weeks happened 50 days later, right? So what is first fruits or Pentecost? What happened there? What did Jesus fulfill there? He gave us the Holy Spirit, which is like the engagement ring, the promise that he'll come back. He leaves us with the Holy Spirit, who's our comforter, our paraclete, not a parakeet. He's our paraclete. <laughs> he comes alongside us. The Holy Spirit uh, strengthens us in times of trial and trouble, comforts us, gives us wisdom, uh, smack in the back of the head when we need it, right? And that happens with me more than the other stuff, probably. Um, Okay, so, and then those he, he fulfilled an order during the Passion Week, and then we had Pentecost 50 days later, and then he ascended into heaven. Wait, there's, there's three more feasts yet that have not been fulfilled, okay? Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, how did Jesus say he was going to return? He's going to return at the last trump which is a term that comes from Yom Teruah, okay? The sound of a trumpet, shouting, and all this kind of stuff. All things that, that happen. Feast of, Feast of Trumpets, um, the reason why it's a day and the hour no one knows is all the other feast days, what they have in common is they're all on a, a full moon. You can see that. You can tell when it's a full moon, okay? The weird thing about Yom Teruah is it's, it's the way they kind of calibrate their calendar every year, and it's on a new moon. It is, for Israel, a new moon is the first little sliver of a moon. That's where it's brand new. Okay, that's a new moon. So because of the time of year it is and the position of the moon and the earth, is that the new moon comes up briefly in the horizon and it'll dip back down. And the timing of that when it does this little up and down thing before it disappears and it doesn't stay up in the sky all night is that it's the same place where you've got the sunset happening. And this is what sets it with official fall, official autumn, okay, and, and the real head of the year. This moves around today in modern times because you want those holidays to happen like on a weekend if you can or to make a longer weekend and things like that. So people move it around, you know, and so it's not a fixed time every time the way it should be. But it's actually originally in the Bible was meant to calibrate the year. So you would send two, two witnesses to, on the top of the mountain. Two witnesses. Does that sound familiar? From Revelation? Okay. You sent two witnesses to the top of the mountain, and their job was they're watchers. And they're watching for the new moon. And you could miss it the first time around because the sun is so bright when it's setting, they didn't have the NASA software they used or whatever or anything like that. They're looking for that first little sliver of moon, and you could miss it, which meant that Yom Teruah was going to be the next day. So they would celebrate it as a two-day weekend. And... Well, weekend, it could be during the week, but it was a two-day holiday, put it that way, a holy day. And um, no man would know the day or the hour, they just know that it's expected, and it depends on the two witnesses. If they finally saw, or when they finally saw the new moon, they'd come back and report it. And, um, you know, the priest would write it down, log it in, and all that kind of stuff that would happen. Um, now, the the last trump, let's see if I can, if I can do this here for you. There are... During the Feast of Trumpets, there would be over this two-day period a hundred different trump, not a hundred different, a hundred trumpet blasts. There are a couple of predominant ones they use, but then um, at the very end, the last trump was the final blast that closed the whole thing out, and it was um, at that time that you'd have one long blast for as long as the trumpeter, the one blowing the shofar, could blow it. Let me see if I can play this in. It'll first play the couple different, if it, if it works right, the couple of different um, trumpet blasts that there are over the two-day period, and then the final one, this guy's holding it out for a long time, but this is the shofar blast for 
Yom Tura. Here it is. And then the last trump is here. Real good lines. You thought your preacher was long-winded. So when you talk about the last trump, no, the last trump is not the last of the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation, as some people try to say, that kind of thing. Book of Revelation wasn't even written in when Paul talked about at the last trump. So this is what it's talking about. So that's the double meaning of what's going on here. Um, and at the last trump, it kind of corresponds with uh, um, Revelation chapter 4, with the way the Lord um, describes Paul, not Paul, John coming up into the, into the heavens. So All right, so this is what's interesting about this last bit of passage here. Starting in verse 37. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Nora, Noah entered the ark. Nora. <laughs> and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them, away, swept them away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So what we've got going on here, as in the days of Noah, is um, business as usual. This is kind of the comparison here. Um, one observation from Daniel J. Harrington in Sacra Pagina, the Gospel of Matthew. He says, the point of the comparison between the days of Noah and the coming of the Son of Man is the unexpectedness of the crisis. So unexpected was the flood that people did not recognize it until it had already come upon them. And then um, John Hart observes in Jesus and the Rapture, and the evidence for the, for the Rapture, he says, the Pauline scenario, that's Paul's writing concerning it, that the day of the Lord will come suddenly at a time of peace and safety is quite comparable to the descriptions found in Matthew 24, 39. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. In the Lord's illustration, the days of Noah were primarily the days before, in verse 38, the judgment and the flood when life continued as normal. During the tribulation, the very existence of all life will be in such jeopardy, as it says in Matthew 24, 22, that the tranquility of life described in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, could hardly take place. Therefore, the Noah illustration taught by Jesus admirably portrays the universal surprise arrival of the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord is time of judgment, right, as we've discussed and we have on our chart here. And the rapture is taught by Paul. So what we've got is we've got business as usual here, um, which is different than what we have with um, when Jesus comes and touches his foot down on the ground. It's a different scenario. That, as we've talked about before, you can kind of calendar that out. Revelation chapter 11, 12, and 13 it gives us descriptions of a number of days that are left, um, written out in terms of days or three and a half years and the number of months in those chapters. So the days of Noah, that's the question. You remember we closed out last week asking this question and I asked you to think about and go reread again. Is that about the rapture or is this about the second coming? So if the second coming then we have to consider the conditions of the end before we can come to that conclusion, right? So, 
here's the question right here. So we have the rapture described in um, one taken, one left. We have described in Matthew 24, 40. Some will say, well, that's, no, they're taken in judgments. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that. But then we've got an issue in, um, flip real quick, go one chapter further into Matthew 25. We're kind of, kind of jump ahead in Matthew 25 because there's more there. And I think it gets missed a lot because Jesus shares some more parables in Matthew 25 before he gets to this point here. So by the time we get to this point here, I think we've forgotten some of what we've read in Matthew 24. Um, look at starting in verse 31 of chapter 25. Um, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, so here we've got the scenario here, we've got the timing. It's he's coming in his glory and all the holy angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So we're definitely not dealing with a rapture event or anything else other than the second coming right here. Verse 32. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. So here we have the sheep and the goats. But one of the main things I, I want you to notice is that what happens with the sheep and the goats is, is that the angels go and they gather everybody. Everybody is gathered at that point and separated into two classes, sheep or goats, right? Now, Matthew 24, was everybody gathered? What happened in Matthew 24? Interesting, right? Matthew 24, one's taken, one's left. So if you try to say Matthew 24 is those people that were taken were taken in judgment, you got a problem because how did the sheep get there? They call, call a cab? Did they call Uber? Jump on a plane? One's taken, one's left. So you've got two different events here. Therefore, we have to conclude as we know clearly from Matthew 25 that we are looking at the second coming, him coming in all his glory and sitting on his throne, that particular event, the sheep and goats event, is the second coming. Then what is the Matthew 24 event? There has to be the rapture. So, again, even though this is my conclusion, and I'm not alone here, even though... Um, You know, we have two different events, and it looks like on the surface that somebody could be taken away in judgment and the believers left, even though that seems like a possibility in the context with Matthew 25, I think that kind of diminishes that possibility. Let, let's look again at, at this, um, because we have it restated here in, in back in chapter 24, look at verse 40. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and he would not have left his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So this again is business as usual as in the days of Noah. Now think about the timing of the days of Noah. Look at this instead here on this timeline is instead of uh, rapture, look at this time of the tribulation period. Look at this as the flood. Okay, Noah's locked into the ark here and then the flood. So all these events that we're talking about is in the days of Noah has to do with the condition of things and uh, what happens to those who are left out in the flood as opposed to Noah. I think the context is more important. Here's another part about context, okay? About those conditions. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Now, 
I tried to use a little humor making this slide here for absurdity sometimes um, is a good way to illustrate things, right? Is this the beginning of the tribulation or before the flood business as usual? Because what are, again, we've said this before, what are the conditions at the end, at the second coming, at the end of the tribulation? Where one's taken, one's left. And people are going on and, and they're eating and drinking, okay? They're eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Um, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other one's left. Okay, all it's, the water there in the field, it's all blood because by the end of the bowl judgments, all the water is blood. You've had 100-pound hail fall. You've had all these asteroids, major earthquakes that have leveled every mountain, sunk every island. And, of course, you have two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and one left. So not exactly the conditions that you look at at the end of the tribulation. The things Jesus describes when he's talking about once taken, one's left, and they're caught off guard is like in the days of Noah where the rain caught them off guard, the flood caught them off guard, judgment caught them off guard. So it's all pre-judgment type of stuff. Some will say that because the wording in Luke 17.37 is um, where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered that the assumption is that Jesus was answering about those taken, when the passage doesn't say anything about that at all, that, it's, that Jesus is addressing those who are taken. Um, Jesus addresses one taken and one left. Again, that's in Luke 17, um, verse 37. The disciples begin, uh, where, Lord? Didn't say where, who. He just said, where, Lord? They're taken. And so... It's a conjecture that his response about is going to be about those who are taken instead of those who are left. But the contrary is really true since, since when are refer, or believers referred to as simply as bodies, where the bodies are there, the vultures are. So the believers are bodies, and what does that have to do with the vultures? It makes more sense that the ones left behind are the ones who are going to end up getting picked over by the vultures. The ones left behind can't be the church and the ones taken judged. Because the ones that are taken aren't going to get become vulture food. The ones that are left behind are going to be killed in judgment, seven-year period, just like Noah's flood. Uh, they didn't ask, where, where are they taken, Lord? They just asked simply, where, Lord? And Jesus decided to answer about bodies and the vultures that will consume them. Uh, this it can't be true of believers um, because it's talking about bodies. So... It fits more closely with Revelation 19 about the bodies and the vultures coming in at the second coming, right? So that seems to fit Revelation 19 more closely. Another weak argument is that because Jesus um, ad addresses Israel that, that nothing like this can impact the church. It's a weak argument because um, all the things that have to do with Israel impact the church, right? Can you think of things that happen to Israel that does not have some sort of impact on the church ultimately. You know, everything does. So subtext, I think, in, in um, the Olivet Discourse is important. And I, and I say that all this because that's to get at this, the timing of this being about the tribulation. Yeah. Also, I, st I still favor the additional argument that Noah's flood was uncalendared and caught the unbelievers by surprise. Yeah. Though Noah did not know the day or the hour the ark was, um, once the ark was completed, Noah watched the animals walk onto the ark. He saw the storm clouds gathering, and he was not caught by surprise or um, unprepared for judgment, the flood coming. He had an ark, and then judgment came after he got in. Um, some of the other different passages like we've discussed before, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, is that the thief type stuff happens to them. They're caught off guard. Paul says it's not, that day is not going to catch you by surprise, right? Like a thief. But them, we're that which is stolen out of the world.
were, were taken out. Again, uh, both Daniel 9 and Revelation 12 indicate that we will know the exact day of the second coming return of Christ. Therefore, these passages speak of uh, more of a surprise rapture event or thief-like event. Will there be business as usual in the days leading up to the second coming of Christ? No. Uh, again, the bold judgments. You can find that, the bold judgments, in um, chapter 16. As in the days of Noah and Lot. Now, this is from Luke 17. Luke adds Lot into the mix, not just Noah. So I think this is very interesting. Luke 17, verses 26 to 31. And you should write down a marginal cross-reference note in Matthew to that. Because Jesus says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They, not us, they were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot. They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, that the one who's on the housetop uh, with his goods in the house not come down to take them away and likewise let the one who is in the field not come back. In other words, you ought to go and, and hide. So, the days of Noah is equal to the days of the Son of Man. That's where he says, just as it was. So, judgment upon the earth. Uh, Noah entered the ark first and then the flood came after. Uh, the days of Lot says likewise. The days of Lot the days when Lot went out first, and then fire and sulfur came down from heaven afterwards. So the Son of Man is revealed first. Um, judgment flee, don't look back, and then the tribulation is as after that. Therefore, Noah and Lot are removed, just like the rapture, first, then judgment. So this isn't, the Matthew 24 passage is not about the second coming because he's talking about things that happened beforehand. This is an, another way to kind of chart it out. So the days of Noah terminology Jesus was using um, in the Olivet Discourse is about rapture, not about the second coming. By the way, um, Lot is a great example of how the church, the, br the bride of Christ, will not be seeing any of God's wrath. All believers are removed before the wrath. Okay, M More come to Christ afterwards, but... Uh, the story of Lot's in Genesis 18. That's another cross-reference you can put down with your Lot note if you want to. Genesis 18, and it's 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 a great chapter, but we're going to focus just real quick quickly here. Um, Ten verses, chapter 18, 22 to 32, and I can read them real quick. Okay. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Verse 23, then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you sweep them away? Will you sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as and to put the same outcome as the wicked, far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? This is a great question because a lot of people today will say, you could, people who believe in the rapture and think that we're not going to go through the tribulation, why do you think believers deserve to skip judgment? You know, the Bible says we're going to go through tribulations in rough times, which is a different kind of tribulation, right? We go through difficult times trials or troubles, but not the trouble upon the earth. So some people will say that. What well, makes you think well, you're just wanting to escape? Well, point them to Lot here, the story of Lot. Go to Luke 17. Go to Genesis 18. Verse 26, And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, 
I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. In other words, it's kind of apologizing in advance for speaking to the Lord. He says, Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he says, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose just 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. And he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. <laughs> and I'll speak and suppose, suppose only 30 are there. He answered, says, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, behold, I've undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose, suppose 20 only 20 righteous are found there. And the answer is, for the sake of 20, I won't destroy it. Are you getting the picture yet here, Abraham? No. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry. I don't want to tick you off here, Lord, but I, let me just speak again this one last time and say, what if there's only 10, just 10? And he says, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And ultimately, what ended up happening? <laughs> Abraham, Lot, <laughs> and family, they left, and he destroyed it. So this is a picture. Jesus said it says in the days of Lot. But he said too when he was getting them out, he goes, we can't do it until you leave. He did say that. He says, you need to go. It's time to go. And he says, I cannot do this. Yeah. It's true. He did. He said, I cannot do this until we're, you leave. You got to go. Hit the door. Is that against the nature of God to put his judgment on the righteous? Right. And you, it kind of begs the question too, why would the bridegroom rain fire and brimstone down on his bride. You know, punish her for the sins of the wicked in the world. We're looking at here, where we've got a, um, a dividing line between the fig tree generation, the fig tree blooms, church age, and the fig tree blooming has really to be 1948 because as all those Old Testament passages we went through um, the last couple of weeks, uh, they are returned, they are brought back into a barren and desolate land. It's nothing, and then the Lord restores their fortunes, the Lord restores their land, it blooms. Um, in order for it to be sometime in the future, you'd have to pull them out again and bring them back into another barren land again, and there's nothing about this. says this. It's a one-time unique thing. It's a miracle thing, because the Bible even says, has, you know, have we ever seen such a thing? Has such a thing ever happened before in a day? We're restored, and we know that the answer to that is, is no. So we have that, and then we have um, folks marrying, drinking, business as usual, as we just described, and then one's taken and one's left, and then destruction, judgment. Okay, that's what we just went through. So again, this, the original chart we looked at, the rapture has to be the event, logically, I, in my opinion, according to the context, one taken, one left, Ones taken has to be the rapture. The ones left are the ones who are the bodies left for the vultures. Because the ones taken in the sheep and goats judgment are the, at the second generation. It's everybody. They're all taken. The angels round them all up. And believers at that point, the sheep go into the millennium. The sheep are mortal believers who made it through, survived. They will go in. If anybody dies of 100 years, he would be considered a child, right? Um, but we read about children in there, and we also read about at the very end of the tribulation period. In Revelation 20, we read that Satan is loosed for a short period, and he round, is able to round up bad guys, unbelievers, to try to get them rounded up, just like Gog and Magog against Jerusalem again. So those... The unbelievers, mortal unbelievers, have to come from somewhere. So you've got to have believers around at the second coming after the sheep and goats judgment go right into the millennial period. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Questions? There have got to be questions or it's just a lot to chew on. But if you're like me, you probably never really looked at the comparison of the Matthew 25 and Matthew 24 before because, again, like I said, as you get into Matthew 25, you read a lot, you know, about the parable of the talents and all this, and you read about the ten virgins and all that type of thing. And then by, so by the time you get to 
way down into Matthew 25, and you read about how all the angels round up everybody for the sheep and goats judgment, you forgot about the one taken and one left back in Matthew 24. But now, you just kind of isolated those two and look at them together and compare that they're two different events. Let me ask a question. I brought up in here some of the, like the feast days. We're going to watch a we're going to, we're going to watch a movie in, in the next couple of weeks. Well, maybe next week we could maybe we're maybe have popcorn ready. we should well, maybe we should just all show up and have popcorn ready and watch that movie um, before the wrath about the wedding Hebrew wedding traditions. Great video. You should watch it and um, and hopefully it makes all these events. There's a reason why Jesus used the wedding traditions as examples of the end times toward the end of his life, the last final few days. We'll take a look at these. But my, my question is, is would you also be interested um, sometime in the next couple of weeks of, of taking a closer look at the feast days or, okay? Okay, so maybe we'll do that. We'll also look at the feast days and how they're fulfilled and, and more details now because it's, it's pretty awesome. It's kind of cool, so we'll spend some time. We are going to get into Revelation, but now, <laughs> hopefully now, hopefully now we see that all this stuff that we've been talking about, how it informs the book of Revelation. So now, I think a lot of people go into Revelation, they're so confused because you don't have this background, these underpinnings of, of knowing about the feast days and the wedding traditions and what Jesus said before John wrote this concerning the end. Now you've got all these underpinnings kind of in the same order that it, that it was written down and put into the Bible before you get to Revelation, which is the last book written. So now you've got this foundational stuff that we tend to miss in the church a lot of times these days, especially in Western culture. We've got this foundational stuff. Now we look and see what John, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, built on top of the, these underpinnings with the book of Revelation when he wrote it, and, and hopefully it'll make it come to life. Okay?